Welcome, everybody. I'm really excited to be able to present uh, our partnership with the California Immigrant Policy Center. Uh, this webinar in particular is focused on expanding Medi-Cal coverage to older and documented seniors. Uh, throughout this uh, webinar, we're going to have various people coming in and uh, being panelists. And to help with that, we're asking that you please mute yourself uh, and turn your video off. Uh, should you have a question, you can definitely use the chat feature, and we'll make sure to get to those questions during the Q&A. So we are in unprecedented times with COVID-19 and our shelter-in-place uh, directives. And we can see even now in the early stages of this crisis that the disproportionate burden of disease and the con economic consequences are falling on the most vulnerable populations in our state. California has over 2 million undocumented individuals. And even though these individuals make up a central part of our economy, they have limited access to health care and safety net services during this crisis. They are more likely to be essential workers uh, and continuing to work. And at the same time, the families of undocumented are more likely to lose their work. Uh, undocumented also face crowded housing conditions, uh, which puts them at additional risk for contracting COVID-19. And in addition, they're excluded from federal stimulus funds, even though they are so central to our economy and they're actually putting their lives at risk for us. We're very fortunate to live in a state that's forward-looking and progressive. California is the first state to advance coverage to undocumented older adults, uh, irrespective of their uh, documentation status. And previously, our state was bold to expand coverage to 19 to 25. In the new fiscal year budget, uh, there's over $100 million to expand coverage to over 27,000 eligible undocumented seniors. But that's not enough. We really need to move forward with uh, advocating for undocumented in terms of the income earned tax credit, as well as maintaining our commitment to expanding coverage and maintaining uh, coverage beyond the fiscal year. Through this panel, I'm hoping that our illustrious esteemed expert panel will highlight what the state can do to further recognize the critical importance of our undocumented uh, citizens are undocumented communities in the state and to keep them safe and supported during this time. So I'd like to turn the uh, attention to uh, the director of the film, um, uh, Seth Hernandez, but before that I wanted to make a plug for uh, donations during this time. Uh, at Cal Ikea, we wanted to elevate the opportunities to actually contribute. As part of this briefing, we were going to feed you all uh, for coming here in Sacramento. And that, given we can't feed you, we're going to use those resources to donate them to um, immigrant families in need. And our, uh, I'd like to just highlight some options here for you. After the panel, when you get your evaluation, we're going to give you a a PDF with all of this information, including options for you to make donations. We are acting locally by uh, pledging a $1,000 donation to the Oakland Undocumented Relief Fund. And we encourage all of you who are in a position to be able to contribute during this time to do so. Thank you so much. And I turn it over to Seth. Um, thank you so much, um, Hector, for that very warm welcome. And thank you, everyone, for the space to be with you all today. Like Hector said, my name is Seth Hernandez Tronquillo, and I'm the producer at the California Immigrant Policy Center, and I'm also the undocumented filmmaker behind coverage. In 2015, I found myself in my first ever full-time job working on the Health for All campaign to help pass Health for All kids in California. Although the target group that year was children for Health for All, the vision for the Health for All campaign has always been to expand health care for all people regardless of their immigration status or age. The film's protagonist, Hector Placencia, and myself, we go way back. I remember how we would used to go visit the Central Valley to better understand the health experiences of migrant farm workers in the great fields of Arvin, California. How we would participate in events with LA-based clinics supporting healthcare access for transgender migrants and communities. How we would work with undocumented young adults 
to develop resources around Medi-Cal access for those fortunate enough to receive DACA. Fast forward five years, it feels like full circle to have been able to work on this film. But we also carry with us the heaviness in understanding that we are here today facing a particularly challenging moment in our lifetimes. I, among many other undocumented comrades, have lost loved ones over the last few years due to lack of access to health care simply because of their immigration status. I bring into this space Tita Maddie, whose name you'll see in the dedication at the end of the film. She advocated for health for all as she herself was battling cancer. I bring into this space our comrade Aide Arana, one of our health for all leaders whom we lost last November, just the day before we premiered coverage in Los Angeles. This moment when not just the state of California, not just this country, but the whole world is facing a pandemic, we recognize how sickness does not discriminate. So why should healthcare? In her book, Decolonizing Methodologies, the indigenous Maori scholar, Linda Tuhiwai Smith writes, the remembering of a people relates not so much to an idealized remembering of a golden past, but more specifically to a painful past. And importantly, people's responses to that pain. Coverage is a film that highlights how undocumented people are not merely just survivors of the circumstances we face, but also how we are leading the movements that impact us and how we ourselves are telling our own stories to empower our community. The film highlights the Health for All campaign by featuring the leadership of two amazing migrant leaders. Echo Placencia, who is one of the founding leaders of the Immigrant Health Justice Movement in California. We're very lucky to have them join us in today's panel. The film also features Emma, a home care worker, an organizer, a grandmother, who is actually taking care of her 93-year-old client as we speak. And I believe she's watching on her phone right now. But we will be playing pre-recorded remarks from her right after the film. This country is always so ready to take the labor of undocumented people, whether it's farm workers who supply the food in our groceries or the home care workers like Emma who are caring for the elderly. But when it comes to upholding their dignity and providing them with basic rights and health care, it's like pulling teeth. We can no longer rely on GoFundMe pages and charity as a form of health insurance. It never was a good enough remedy to begin with. Now more than ever, what we need is action rooted in solidarity to build better infrastructures so that all people have access to the care they deserve, whether it's during a pandemic or not, whether they are old or not so old, a citizen or undocumented. The screening begins with a trailer of films by talented undocumented filmmakers such as Dario Guerrero, Kenya Guillen, Lidiet Arevalo, and Paulo Ame Reyn. After the credits roll, we will have a post-screening discussion, as Hector has mentioned, featuring some stellar panelists to unpack the legislative and public health implications of what we will see on, on the screen. We also invite you to go to cover-age.org if you'd like to host a virtual screening of the film in your own community, if you'd like to get more resources about the film and about the Health for All campaign. And we're also having a national virtual broadcast with the National Domestic Workers Alliance on February 29th, in case anyone is interested to join us later this month. Most caregivers are undocumented, live in isolation, to, afraid to come forward, and an easy target for exploitation and abuse by unscrupulous employers or clients or agency owners by not paying us the minimum wages, no overtime pay, excluded in benefits like health insurance, paid time off, paid sick leave. Yes, it is very ironic that I am a caregiver and yet I could not get my own care. I am a caregiver. Where shall I go when I get sick? I am a caregiver taking care of people, but who takes care of me? As undocumented people, we really don't have many choices in life. We take on jobs that ordinary Americans will not take. We are most vulnerable to abuse and economic exploitation, 
always at the mercy of our employers being paid below minimum and no benefits like paid time off, paid sick leave, and like health insurance. And as undocumented adults, we are also excluded to have complete access to health care services from the government. And with this COVID-19 pandemic, undocumented domestic workers like me, a caregiver, a frontliner, risk my life every day. I work with people most vulnerable to the illness, like the elderly and people with compromised immune systems. This COVID-19 virus infects anybody, young or old, sick or poor. So why should governments aid access to health care and safety measures exclude the immigrants, especially the undocumented workers during this worldwide health crisis? So it is time for legislators to take immediate action to protect the health and safety of undocumented adult immigrants. That is why as a worker leader of Filipino Workers Center, I continue to be an advocate, campaign for more home care workers' rights so that one day we'll, we will have the same respect and our dignity back because we deserve the same job protection as everyone else. Lastly, health care services is a universal right. Every person should be able to access the health the healthcare they need regardless of their status aids and income. Hello, my name is Orville Thomas. I hope everyone has a chance to hear me. I have the honor of serving as the Director of Government Affairs for the California Immigrant Policy Center. Uh, before we begin the panel discussion, I want to thank our protagonist, Emma, as she's currently taking care of her patient. Professionally and personally, she is doing the work that keeps our community safe and healthy. You are such an inspiration, Emma, for all of those in our immigrant community and one of the essential heroes that are helping patients during this pandemic. The California Immigrant Policy Center has been leading the Health for All movement in California for the better part of the last decade. Through incremental victories, over 300,000 children and young adults now have access to Medi-Cal coverage, but those victories have always been muted by the fact that so many more people continue to be denied the opportunity to age with dignity and health. Last year, when we celebrated Health for All Young Adults, it was tempered by those 19 to 26 year old young adults that are now just living with their health care coverage, but knowing that they are healthy enough only to watch their grandparents and community members fall victim to illness. And now the moment has found us. California has a chance to respond to COVID-19 in a way that helps us grow coverage options for all Californians, regardless of immigration status, in this panel that I am so proud to be able to moderate of elected officials, researchers, medical professionals, and activists will be able to discuss how and what it will take to help expand Medi-Cal coverage to all and how the current pandemic is affecting the conversation on healthcare expansion. I'll do a brief introduction for all the panelists and then we can get to the questions. For more information on the panelists and a fuller bio, please see the agenda that was sent out for this event. Our first panelist representing Los Angeles and East LA, the author of Senate Bill 29 to expand Medi-Cal to seniors 65 and older, regardless of immigration status, the Honorable Senator Maria Elena De Raza. Representing Fresno, the author of Assembly Bill 4 to expand Medi-Cal to all Californians that qualify, regardless of immigration status, the Honorable Assembly Member, Dr. Joaquin Arambula. Joining us as a pro Associate Professor of Public Policy at UC Riverside, Dr. Cecilia Aon, our, one of our film protagonists and Executive Director of Placencia Consulting, Hector Placencia, and finally, the Director of the Altamed Institute for Health Equity, Dr. Efren Delamante. Thank you all for joining. Our first question will go to Senator Durazo. Senator, we are acknowledging the current state that we live in, especially with COVID-19 and the pandemic. We had the chance to see the governor propose Medi-Cal for all elders in his January budget that would have started next year. Now the Latino caucus has been very clear with the governor about next steps to respond and to recover to this pandemic. What has been the response from the administration and how did the caucus come together to make some of those asks? Thank you, Orville. 
Um, I appreciate uh, the invitation to be on and to be with all my sisters and brothers who have been fighting for this issue for years and years now. So we've made progress because of your work. Um, and I just want to also say that this is an unprecedented environment that we're in, a world pandemic. We have never known anything like this. Um, and so it shows what our strengths are. It also shows what our weaknesses are. Um, health crisis, humanitarian crisis, economic crisis. So based on all of that, as a caucus of approximately 30 Latino legislators, we felt that it was important to raise the issues of the most vulnerable. And unfortunately, the most vulnerable continue to be undocumented men, women, and children in this state. They contribute so much. Uh, they are so integrated into our environment that we just can't pretend that they could be excluded without it having a connection to us. So for us, the best way of addressing the um, COVID-19 is to include all undocumented on those levels, on healthcare. They should be included uh, 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 to make sure that they have access to healthcare in this crisis. If they are not included, the rest of us are hurt. The rest of us will pay the consequences because they are already integrated in our community. So as a caucus, we raised three issues to the, to the governor. Uh, one is uh, that we would have uh, undocumented, would have access to a uh, um, relief uh, uh, package uh, under the Employment Development Department that would help them replace some of their wages like all workers who have been um, unemployed, who have lost their jobs. Um, second is we wanna make sure that they have access in the future, uh, right now, with regards to applying for the earned income tax credit by using their ITIN number. And third most important is access for, um, through Medi-Cal, to our undocumented seniors 65 and over. It is so urgent. They are the most vulnerable. We've said that, we've said that over and over and over again. So if they're the most vulnerable, they should have starting now, the access to Medi-Cal to take care of related issues as well as directly anything um, um, uh, COVID-19. Uh, and I just wanna say thank you to the governor. He had included uh, uh, undocumented seniors in the January budget. We think it should be um, um, we should uh, make that now available now and not wait until January of 2021. The urgency, the crisis is now. It's a health, public health care crisis. Let's include all of our vulnerable populations, especially our seniors. Thank you, Senator. Our next question is to Dr. Rambula. Uh, Dr. Rambula, you are on the front lines and seeing what's happening in the Central Valley right now especially with COVID-19, has this pandemic started having different uh, conversations with your colleagues around the need of healthcare for all and your advocacy to make sure that all Californians have access to care? Sure, and if I can, I just wanna take a moment and first acknowledge that the Health for All movement did not start with us. I am appreciative of organizations like CIPC and Health Access, and the coalition I support of organizations such as the California Immigrant Policy Center, among the 40 organizations that wrote to the administration to work with the legislature to expedite implementation of the Health for All Elders proposal. And in light of our present COVID-19 emergency, I am activated and am a leading voice the Health for All movement helps to bring me out of my comfort zone of practicing emergency medicine. And as we talk about economic distress and lack of access to health care and quality health care, especially given our reality that there are many cracks within our system. And then when we see people who fall through those cracks, many times the only place for them to go is the emergency room department. And in my career, I, was, uh, I saw 50,000 patients myself, and I intimately am aware of the struggle that my community faced. 
in my district, one out of five patients are undocumented. And because I know their stories intimately, I knew I had to be a strong voice in our capital and I'm proud to be that voice. And we'll continue to work on these issues as the COVID-19 pandemic has rattled our healthcare system across California. I do think it's vital that all our communities are included and that we think about them because some of us feel like we get overlooked. It's long overdue that we take care of those who have taken care of us. It is more important than ever that we double down on our commitment to health equity in our state. As a scientist, I'll tell you that I take seriously what research tells us. And it says that insurance coverage expansion has been linked to multiple benefits for individuals, for communities, and the state. Studies have shown that it increases both economic and health benefits to those who gain health insurance. Expanded coverage has been linked to the lower mortality rates and improved education and employment outcomes. I think we've taken the first steps as California to broaden affordable options for our undocumented immigrants who are, as we know, a substantial share of our uninsured state residents. Providing affordable insurance coverage options for undocumented immigrants is a key component of any strategy to continue reducing the numbers of Californians uninsured. Thank you, Assemblyman. Thank you so much for your work. Our next question is to Dr. Ion. Dr. Ion, you've been conducting field work, research in the Inland Empire on the health needs of undocumented elders. Can you speak to what some of were your findings? Yes, we, um, thank you. Good afternoon and thank you for the opportunity to be part of this panel. So we completed in-depth interviews with uh, 30 undocumented older adults. And I'm just gonna present some of the highlights here. So we looked at the intersection of health need and access and nearly half of our sample had a chronic health condition already. So they had diabetes, high blood pressure, um, high cholesterol levels, arthritis, aches and pains from job related injuries. A, a couple of our participants already were experiencing some complications due to these chronic health conditions. So one of our participants had lost her sight and another partial had partial um, loss of eyesight. Another person was on dialysis. Um, so then when we looked at access, we were able to classify people into three different categories. So we had individuals who said they had no access to care. Um, and here the primary barrier was the cost. So cost prevented individuals from being diagnosed. So here individuals might already know they feel some symptoms, but they're unable to go to um, access care. So it prevented them from being diagnosed, it prevented them from receiving routine or preventative care, and it also prevented them from following up. So if they had already been to the emergency room and were referred to a specialist, they were unable to follow up on that referral because um, they couldn't afford it. Um, the second category we identified was individuals who already were accessing care, and this implied paying out of pocket for care. So typically individuals were going to community health clinics and they were the group of individuals who already had the chronic health conditions. So accessing care was a necessity. So in order to get the treatment, to get the medications, they needed to access care. And these individuals reported that their routine visits could cost anywhere between $100 to $300 out of pocket. And individuals who had more advanced conditions would have to pay more. So if you needed additional lab work, if you needed a biopsy that month, then one person started paying up to $1,000 out of pocket in, in a month. And then the final category was what we called ambiguous access. And here individuals were accessing services through programs such as the Medically Indigenous Services Program. So MISP offers um, assistance uh, at a short term between a month to 12 months. And the reason why we classified it as ambiguous access because often the participants mentioned that there was so much uncertainty related to accessing care through MISP because they didn't really know what the continuity of services would be through these programs. Um, and also I wanna mention that not everyone that we talked to was aware that 
they could access services through a program such as MISP because again, it's, it's, a, county, it's a county base, so eligibility even within our region varies. So Riverside expands MISP to undocumented and San Bernardino does not. Um, and finally, I also want to stress, like people have mentioned before, that this is a vulnerable population. So what we heard from our, in, from our participants is that they have no savings are very limited savings and they live month to month. So they're financially vulnerable. Um, and we hope to release another policy brief on this topic alone. Um, but as it relates to this conversation, because they are financially vulnerable, paying out of pocket is not sustainable, especially if their health begins to decline and then they won't be able to work, right? So right now they're paying out of pocket based on what they're able to work. So if they, be, if they're, condition escalates, they will not be able to work and pay for that care. Thank you, Dr. Ion. And some of your comments definitely helped me bridge this next uh, discussion with Dr. Talamantes. You know, we would talk about access, we talk about chronic conditions that are underlying. Dr. Talamantes, like, can you comment on how COVID-19 has impacted care delivery for our older adults at AltaMed and how the state's coverage expansion you know, may have changed the approach to connecting to care in a public health pandemic. Health is first and foremost uh, at the front of our minds and thinking about uh, all the different challenges we're facing today. Uh, there's not probably one person uh, who's participating today who's not thinking about their own health. Um, I've been at Ultimed for about a year and a half now and I serve as a medical director for Ultimed Institute for Health Equity and both from uh, the perspective of uh, thinking about the documentary and how it really hit home. Uh, both, uh, we have programs that focus not only on our elderly patients, but also caregivers. Um, and a lot of the, the, the sharings that were shared really um, are the responsibility many times of our community health centers, right? Those community health centers that are federally funded, that are supported by our, our great state uh, and many of the champions here uh, really are left with the responsibility to try to take care of people um, at the, when those chronic conditions, hypertension, diabetes, as mentioned, have really done a lot of damage. And so how do we get ahead of this? Uh, I think, again, the steps taken, uh, this great state, uh, now more than ever, uh, as we th think about these issues uh, pre-pandemic and, and now as we surge in the pandemic and really understand the devastating effects it's going to have on many of our communities that, that we're worried about. And, you know, if you look at some of the uh, data coming out of um, other states, uh, we're seeing that this virus is discriminating and is going after the most vulnerable. We understand that it's impacting our elderly, uh, those with hypertension, diabetes. Uh, we're seeing huge devastating effects in our African-American communities. Uh, we expect to see the same in our own communities. Um, and so at Ultimed, we, we have had to rapidly uh, think about how we provide care. Uh, we're not able to see people when there's a shelter in place uh, directive. Uh, so we, now we're offering telephone visits. We're expanding to video visits. Uh, we're thinking about healthcare differently. I think it's a tremendous opportunity for our state to think about how we can expand coverage using technology. Uh, to be able to care for people, bring them in when they need to be brought in, and, and really keep them uh, healthy. Um, I was at the Outdoor Evaluation Center where we do our evaluations for people who are symptomatic of COVID-19. Um, many uh, health, uh, folks who are caretakers are coming in, um, asking for testing, saying, I cannot go back to work unless I get a test from you, unless it's negative. Uh, my, my employer or whoever I, I work for doesn't want me to come into the house. Uh, so again, there's a huge, I mean, this is not expanding coverage and understanding what's happening today is a zero sum game. We have to expand coverage and take care of the most vulnerable because they take care of us. Uh, they're coming into our homes. We wanna make sure they stay healthy. And if they ha have hypertension and diabetes, we're not just worried about COVID-19, we're worried about those chronic conditions that continue to impact them. And so how do we think about uh, a new care delivery model uh, given the expansion of technology and permissions that we've been given by the country, uh, by the state? Uh, we need to continue that uh, even post pandemic. Um, and it's a great opportunity. Again, most of my patients, uh, elderly patients, 
uh, have phones. They pick up the phone. They, they uh, really enjoy talking to me, uh, me asking about their diabetes, hypertension, making sure they have their medication, reassuring them about what steps to take to prevent them from getting COVID-19, uh, identifying social barriers too. Many times if there's patients who um, need help with forms uh, because they're applying for something and they don't understand how, or more importantly, if they have an immediate need, like uh, they need groceries and connecting them to some of the work that's happening here at Ultima to get people uh, food when they need it. Um, so those are some of the steps. Uh, I think, uh, again, great work. Uh, everyone um, and everyone who's participating today, um, everyone is a conduit to share why healthcare is so important uh, and more today because we have a reason for it. Um, and, and there's nothing like a pandemic to really light a fire and make change happen. Thank you, Dr. Talamantes. Our last panelist, Hector. Pandemic, COVID-19, we have so many things that you know, the community is asking for. How has your work in the advocacy and organizing fields um, had to shift to address all these needs, the unique, unique circumstances, and our undocumented community? Thank you, Orville. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for tuning in. My name is Imelda Platen. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, my name is Hector Plasencia. I was given the name Imelda. Um, as I mentioned in the film, I am undocumented and transgender. And I'm feeling a little nervous as people are talking. I, I feel the need to cry. I feel the need to, to take deep breaths. It's, um, it's been a long time. We've been working on the health campaign since 2013. And one of the beautiful things that I love about working with undocumented immigrant communities, marginalized, oppressed transgender communities is that um, we are very creative, we are very innovative. Uh, we have an outsider's perspectives of living, living outside of systems and that affords us uh, a perspective that is very unique and, and why more people that are directly impacted and are uh, undocumented themselves should be more involved. I think it's this perspective that it's really going to move us through. What this pandemic has afforded us is for, for our entire world to be able to have insight, or insight to this perspective of what it's like to be isolated and, and neglected um, in, uh, by a structure and by an institution that can, that can be adjusted, that can, that can be changed. And in, in this work, uh, being able to witness a lot of our people uh, pass um, as this work has moved forward. Uh, we understand that this is a form of institutional genocide. It is very much a way of being able to um, have undocumented and immigrant communities be in a, in a place where we forget how powerful we are, the role that we play, and how significant we really are to this country. And so I hope that people have understood much more deeply um, how much immigrant communities um, uh, are an, an asset and essential. Uh, moving forward, it's not just our organizers and our advocacy that has needed to adjust. We all need to adjust the way in which we govern, the way in which we advance policy, the way in which we structure our institutions and deliver uh, services, all of that needs to change. And so in being able to work with advocates, policymakers, and organizers and being able to create movements, we really want to encourage and move forward everyone's participation um, in advancing health justice. Um, in order to be able to reach health justice, we invite people to work against, with, and without institutions. And that's really a way in which we are going to uh, advance our healthcare justice movement um, and really understand that health is the foundation uh, of all of our movements. Working against is where we are today. We understand that the way the structure stands, it doesn't, it isn't, it isn't working. Um, and like Dr. Talamantes just mentioned, we have to. This is something that we have to do. It's, it's not a matter of if um, the, the time in which we are left to do it is, is, uh, is here. Um, 
working with institutions is everyone being able to first understand how our healthcare system works and how understand their place within the healthcare system. I think once we get an understanding of how it is structured and how difficult it is to navigate, um, just more voices need to be elevated about the need for it to change. And lastly, without, it's really what we are left with here in isolation, where a lot of us can't depend on institutions, a lot of us can't depend on services, and so we are left with our networks, our family, our relationships, people that care about us, check in on us, and, and that is how many of us are surviving and being able to lend each other money, do uh, fundraisers, um, asking in these many ways, because although we understand that there is so much resilience, so much power, if we do not change the structure in which we live in, it, it, is, it is not enough and it is not sustainable. Um, so again, we invite people, every, everyone, whether you are in policy, advocacy, um, or a community organizer, again, in order for us to reach healthcare justice, we need to work against, with, and without systems. Um, lastly, uh, it is uh, increasingly significant um, for everyday people to be able to be engaged and, um, and learn who their representatives, representatives are. We have uh, Senator Durazo and Assemblymember Arambula here today. We invite you to also visit this bit.ly, B-I-T-L-Y slash Use Your Voice California. There you can go and find who your representative is and really express the need for immigrant and undocumented communities to be able to have access to health care. As uh, being a protagonist on this film, I am um, positioned um, to be able to speak around um, uh, health fraud, and it is not my task alone. It is not something that I carry on my own. There's an entire coalition, a lot of undocumented people themselves that have really adopted um, this movement uh, to be able to speak about it. So again, uh, we invite you to, to join us uh, and work with, against, and without institutions. Uh, we will continue to uh, advance the Health for All movement through your involvement and your participation. Thank you, Hector. Um, when the next couple of minutes, we'll open up questions to the audience. Uh, for my next question, I want to start with our two elected officials. Uh, Dr. Rambula, you just listened to so many descriptions and needs from our community. How do legislators like yourself and Senator Durazo work with the governor's office when we're hearing so much about economics and needing to pull down what our budget expectations were? And unfortunately, all of these proposals are going to take real investment from the state of California. So uh, first and foremost, if I can, I do want to acknowledge that we have a governor who is committed to a healthcare system that covers everyone. You know, he has appointed this uh, Healthy California for All Commission, which is working to develop a plan for advancing our healthcare delivery system to increase both coverage and access. And I want to just um, announce again publicly that I remain committed to engage with our administration to get to 100% coverage and to amplify our voices to, as to why Health for All Elders is especially vital during our new reality. The state's response to the novel coronavirus has been swift and effective as the landscape continues to rapidly evolve. Our low-income elders are especially vulnerable, and seniors are more medically fragile and face barriers that make it harder for them to access health care in this critical time. The COVID-19 pandemic makes starkly clear something that we have expressed throughout the campaign for Health for All, that the health of each one of us is deeply inter interconnected with that of every Californian we must recognize that our shared humanity and care for each other, our neighbors, and those most, most vulnerable of falling through the gaps of our social safety net. Now, I think your question was regarding during this crisis, and I do trust that my colleagues will make decisions that protect 
all who call California home. We do have uh, uh, twice weekly uh, caucus meetings. And I announced this screening during the caucus meeting right beforehand to see if I could get others to want to come. I think we need to continue to highlight. I wanna echo the words of Senator Durazo who mentioned that the Latino caucus was supportive. I was on that conference call yesterday. I think we're going to need all avenues to continue to highlight the plight of those who are undocumented and elder. Now I need to be clear. I believe that public programs should not exclude any group of people from primary and preventative care, especially as we are responding to a public health emergency. Undocumented Californians are deeply rooted in our state and provide significant economic, familial, and cultural contributions to our communities. Despite their vital place in California, we continue to recognize that our undocumented and uninsured Californians live sicker, die younger, and are one emergency away from financial ruin because they are locked out of comprehensive health care. Senator Durazo? We, we are advocating for so much in this time. You know, how has that changed the way that you talk to the administration about it? How has it changed the way your office operates? Well, um, it just uh, makes the issue of covering undocumented families even more urgent. I don't understand, I'm not a doctor, but I don't understand how we can tackle and defeat something like a pandemic the coronavirus without covering everyone. It, I, I don't understand how we can do that. I agree with Assembly Member Arambula. The governor is making very strong and bold decisions. He's got a lot on his shoulders, um, but we have to continue to remind him and his administration that we cannot tackle and defeat this virus unless there is the freedom, the ability for everyone, everyone to be able to get the healthcare attention that they need. And so, yes, there is always an issue of dollars. We never have enough dollars um, and we have to make those tough decisions, but this should not be on the short list of an impossible decision. It should be on the short list of things we have to do. So I, um, I only know how to keep on and keep on with our struggles. The stories, um, Hector's stories, Emma's stories, all these stories have to be lifted up, have to be uh, uh, told over and over and over. We have, to, we have new ways of communicating, but we have to keep communicating those stories um, uh, to remind all the decision makers uh, that we have to address this even more so than we did before. Mm -hmm. Going to an emergency room, imagine taking up uh, an emergency room when we could be given the attention without having to go to an emergency room, unless you, you really, really need it. Um, um, out of pocket. I mean, these are the sorts of things that happen to everyday people. And undocumented play into the system. They pay taxes, they, they contribute in every way. They are essential workers out in the fields as farm workers, putting food on our tables in California and throughout the nation. We owe it to them to be treated like everybody else. So that's all I can say is let's just keep at it. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Thank you to both the elected officials on the panel. Our next question, I want to pivot to Dr. Ione. Dr. Talamantes, Hector, you know, this COVID pandemic, COVID-19 pandemic is coming at a time when immigrants are starting to go back into the shadows. The public charge issue for the last couple of years has seen immigrants starting to take themselves off of the social safety net benefits that they are, have available. Are you starting to see that at the community level where you know, people are so fearful of just general federal immigration enforcement 
that they won't want to get benefits, that they don't come to their meetings? This is yes. uh, Efrain. <laughs> Go I, ahead, Efrain. Yeah, from the perspective of, of Ultimed, um, you know, we, we, if anything, we're seeing an increase in, in demand for services um, across, across the board. Um, I do think that uh, people are in, very cautious as to what they're asking for. Um, but, you know, any, any of these um, symptoms that we get today, fever, cough, um, shortness of breath, um, you know, really prompt people to, to seek care. And, and we've been doing our best to make sure we get the word out that we are here for the community, uh, regardless of uh, insurance status, uh, documentation status, uh, you know, and, and making sure that they understand that uh, we're only a phone call away from accessing a uh, healthcare service, uh, talking to one of our physicians, or being able to come into one of our evaluation centers. Um, so if anything, I think uh, pre, pre uh, pandemic, we, we, we were seeing um, some declines, but I think the pandemic has put in put this into context that there's a huge demand. And not only are we, uh, again, discovering that people have these acute issues, they also have chronic issues that can that need continuity that need support. And so again, we, we don't want to just take care of people one time, we want to make sure we uh, provide that service long term so that they uh, stay healthy over a long period of time. So thank you. Hector, you were talking? Yes, thank you. I'd, I'd add uh, similarly that people are being cautious. I think uh, Altamed has built a very strong reputation along with other uh, clinics, uh, community clinics in uh, Southern California, Sanchez Cunica Romero, um, and St. John's Well Child and Family Center to be uh, centers that are really welcoming to immigrant communities. Um, being able to work with institutions is, is, is that work, is a lot of uh, the, the structure and development that has intentionally been put into organizations like Altamed um, to be, when, when something urgent does come, um, to be able to, to be a resource. That's not the case in various other parts of the region, um, such as uh, San Bernardino County, for example, where uh, Dr. Ayon has been conducting her research. Uh, there definitely has been, there, there is always a need, and now there's been an increase. It's really dependent on where people go where, um, for, the, um, for them to be able to feel uh, feel safe and comforted. So really inviting other uh, community-based organizations, institutions to create the, create the same um, so, so that folks do feel comfortable. We are always going to be scared. There's always going to uh, be fear, especially just how um, immigrant lives are, are treated in this country. Um, so a lot of our work um, especially uh, now that we are home is build, being able to um, to build that understanding and um, uh, navigation of these institutions, um, learning um, and moving forward with doing things, even though we're scared, even though we're afraid, um, we still have to move forward. Mm -hmm. Dr. Ion, Hector kind of talked about San Bernardino and in your area and in your research, how does the public charge, you know, in the process that we've seen kind of play out over the last couple of years now affect the uh, response that we're seeing during the COVID-19 pandemic? Um, yeah, so I think, you know, there's, there's been barriers to accessing care, like in our region, like I mentioned earlier in Riverside, there's a little bit more support versus in San Bernardino that there isn't. Um, and I think, I can't, I'm not in the field, like, providing medical services. So I can't specifically answer that question, but I will say from a researcher perspective, mm -hmm. um, in, in the process of us completing the study, when we think about the undocumented older adult population, they are a hard to reach population. Like we really struggle to get our sample of 30 in our region. And this might be an issue just in our region, um, but the research was conducted in collaboration with with three nonprofits that have deep seated roots with the undocumented population in that region. And we really struggled to recruit people, even though we have these tr trusted relationships, right? And what we learned, the biggest lesson that we learned was how unconnected the undocumented older population is 
to services and organizations. So in terms of thinking about now expanding access and, and getting people involved in accessing services, so getting them to enroll and, and, and accessing services, I think we're gonna have to be really strategic um, I think like um, Dr. Talamante mentioned earlier, you know, there is a need now, so people will be seeking care. But I think, you know, like it was mentioned earlier, this still is a population that is in the shadows, right? So we need to understand that this, especially the undocumented older adults, I think they want to be in the shadows. Like they don't want to run the risk of being detained, being deported, um, because many of them don't have anywhere to return to in their country of origin. So, so I think this is a population that's in the shadows. So in terms of thinking about how we're going to get them to enroll and come out, we, we're going to have to be very strategic and thinking about, you know, partnerships with immigrant serving organizations using models that we know have been effective in, in working with hard to reach populations, such as like a promotoras model or community health worker models, and, and really even incentivizing these programs. Because again, there hasn't been a big push for serving the undocumented older adult population. So a lot of organizations don't even have programs for this specific group. So I think we need to really think about how do we incentivize the creation of these types of groups that, or these types of organizations, these types of services that specifically target undocumented older adults and really start working through their networks. So we might have to start by reaching out to their granddaughters, to their kids, to actually get to the older adults. So I think we're going to have to be really strategic and thinking about how do we reach, reach out to them. You know, if they're not feeling any of the COVID symptoms right now, but if, but if we really want them to actually come out and get care once, you know, hopefully we get this through, we, we're going to have to be strategic and thinking about that. Thank you. Hector, I see you want to respond. Yes, thank you, Ordo. To, to add to Dr. Ayon's comment, um, just being able um, to think about long term is really, really key. Like she just mentioned, being able to have a strategic um, implementation plan for how to be able to address them. Um, part of our long term strategy is again, being able to under, um, also teach undocumented people how the system functions um, in its most basic level so that there is, it doesn't feel as overwhelming. Um, the immigration system and our healthcare system are two of the most complex systems that we have here uh, in the United States. Um, and so being able to break those down is part of what um, alleviates some of the fear as well as um, some of the trust can begin to form with undocumented and immigrant populations. Um, once we alleviate some of that unfamiliarity, which we also invite organizations to be able to do in working with undocumented immigrant populations, um, we do want to offer services um, and our work is also to be able to educate and teach and often teaching and um, going through what the system looks like um, both immigration and healthcare can be complex and difficult for us to be able to understand ourselves. So being able to, to share that with our community becomes that much more challenging. Um, so popular education is definitely key in being able to um, learn how to navigate these institutions and systems. Um, so we alleviate that fear and begin to develop trust and comfort in engaging with them as these programs roll out. All right. Thank you, Hector. And I know our time is coming to an end and I want to address the elected officials before they go. Advocacy and what they can do to support your guys' efforts and, you know, continuing to educate others in our community. How can those on this call help? And Senator Durazo, we'll start with you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, um, you all know what it takes to raise this issue. You've been doing it for several years now. And I would encourage everybody who has been able to participate in this meeting to connect with the affiliated organization on the ground and do what we saw in the film. You know, get active by telling your story, get active by mobilizing your neighbors, your friends. We know this is an issue that matters to everybody. We know that. We have to make it crystal clear to all of those decision makers, legislators, um, help us, help us to bring the power of the people on the ground to uh, raise this issue and make sure that undocumented are treated equally, 
non -dis not discriminated against, treated equally as all other Californians. We have a great administration with Governor Newsom, and we need to make that connection um, so that uh, we work together. So thank you all very much. Okay, Dr. Arambula, anything you wanted to add to this? You know, sure. I probably just want to start with some architecture questions. Many of you know I serve on the uh, both the budget committee and the subcommittee for health and human services. And you know, the ambitious January budget that we saw from the governor will look much different come June 15th. Um, as a response to the crisis, we have been trying to figure out how to alleviate the burdens on working families. And we have extended our tax deadlines. And with very little sales tax being generated right now, the budget we pass will be more about what our state's fiscal health is from last year than it is what we know now. And so we will likely be amending this budget to account for the new and existing programs that we wanna talk about in the summer and the fall as we start to know more. And these summer and fall discussions will have time for discussions on new policies and programs just as we are speaking about now. And we will continue to push as hard as we are able to extend healthcare to those who need it most. But I'd like to echo the words of Hector if I can and just think we have to continue to speak out against hateful rhetoric, particularly amongst our immigrant communities. I think we should figure out how to work with our congressional members to actually pass comprehensive immigration reforms. And without any of the institutions, I think we have to organize our communities to tell our stories. This documentary is powerful for a number of reasons, but it's because it's our community's voice. And as we start to tell our story, I'm confident that our democracy our government will remember and work for our communities. I wanted to thank you guys for having me on this panel. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Rambula, for taking the time and the work that you continue to do uh, in the Capitol and on the front lines. Hector, I wanted to talk with you and see if there's any tips as the advocate on the call that you could offer for some of the people that are still on the, the Zoom. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you, Orville. Lastly, I'd say that movement building is not a solo act. I know that this uh, pandemic, pandemic is teaching us to be able to understand much more in depth our interconnectedness. Um, and so with that, it means that we have to seek help. We have to seek each other. Um, we have to understand institutions and our place within them and how it all functions, understand the context in which we are living in. And being able to get to that point is again, difficult to be able to do on our own, um, especially for people that are marginalized and don't have access are most deeply in the shadows. Um, so being able to advance any of this um, again, is um, from community to capital. Our consulting agency, Placenta Consulting Inc., works with um, our slogan is from community to capital because we understand that our ability to be able to create change and movement is interconnected and, and, and um, dependent on each other. Community needs capital and capital needs community. And the closer that we get to being able to understand that, um, I think the closer that we'll get to being able to um, have um, actual justice in various forms um, within the United States. Hector, just a really quick follow-up. Is there an ideal timeline for people to be involved, especially with the budget? Now? <laughs> That's why I did this. So again, I shared it on the chat notes um, for people that are, are watching and hopefully this recording later as well. Again, it is... Uh, bit.ly use your voice california um, those capitals you do have to put in those capitals it's a quick link just for you to be able to look up um, who your representatives are here in california and for us to be able to get into the habit of just being able to call them regularly and letting them know that 
um, immigrant rights and health justice um, is key to the success um, and thrive of California. Thank you. And Dr. Delamontes, any last words from the service provider and Alta Med side? Uh, we have uh, an incredible amount of work to do, um, and I just really uh, want to thank everyone who's behind us and ensuring that the front line is also responding. Um, we understand that as um, healthcare continues to be a, a challenge for our communities, we want to be there. Um, and so I just want to thank everyone uh, for your support. Thank you. And Dr. Ione, just last words to close out our panel. I just want to thank everyone that all the healthcare providers that are in the front line and all our, our advocates that are doing all this work. And I just hope to be able to support them through the research that we do. Thank you all so much. In the comments section, a uh, nice note from Set talking about what you can do if you want to host a screening and get more info about Health for All, please visit www.cover age.org, so coverage with the dash in between. And we're also having a national virtual screening on April 29th in partnership with the National Domestic Workers Alliance, Working Films, and the Center for Cultural Power. I want to thank you all from the California Immigrant Policy Center. Uh, Hector, I might toss to you, Hector Rodriguez, so I might toss to you for um, Kalahia as a final. Yeah, I just wanted to thank you, Oroville, uh, for doing such a great job with moderating this panel and for the partnership of the California Immigrant Policy Center and all the organizations represented today. We are in this together. Uh, let's continue the fight. Thank you so much.